Good evening, everyone. As Jessica said, I'm Madhav Rajan. I'm the Dean of Chicago Booth and also the George Schultz Professor of Accounting here. I hope all of you are doing well. It's great to see such an amazing turnout uh, today uh, to uh, hear Tom. So it's a great pleasure to have you here to welcome Booth alumnus Tom Ricketts of the Cubs and in Capital to our virtual Distinguished Speaker Series. So the Distinguished Speaker Series is a long-standing tradition and we bring in high profile leaders from business, uh, from the government, from the community to share their insights and experience. So we kicked the series off last week with uh, Kurt Del Bene from uh, Microsoft. Uh, and then next week we'll have Byron Trott from uh, BDT and then Jenny Scanlon from Underwriter Labs uh, and then finishing with uh, Professor Richard Taylor the week after that. Uh, so let me uh, introduce today's speaker. It truly is a delight to introduce Tom Ricketts uh, who I'm sure needs no introduction. Tom is executive chairman of the Chicago Cubs. Uh, in 2009, he led his family's acquisition of the team from the Tribune Company. Uh, when his family was introduced as the new owner of the Cubs, Tom laid out uh, three goals. Uh, first was to win the World Series. Second was to preserve and improve Wrigley Field for future generations. Uh, and the third was to be good neighbors, giving back to the city and the, and the neighborhood. And uh, we'll, we'll hear from Tom about how he feels that he has been doing on those uh, KPIs. Uh, Tom is also chairman of InCapital, uh, LLC, which he co-founded in 1999. Uh, InCapital is an investment bank with underwriting and distribution expertise in a wide range of securities. So they began with the corporate notes platform and Tom led InCapital's diversification initiatives in the, in the US into agencies, certificates of deposit, mortgage-backed securities, and preferred securities. Uh, InCapital is the market leader and the largest third-party distributor of market link CDs and market link notes. Tom holds both a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Chicago and of course an MBA from uh, Chicago Booth. So we're thrilled to have Tom here today to speak to us about uh, the Chicago Cubs and the organization's response to COVID-19. Uh, but to start, I'm gonna just let Tom speak a little bit about the situation we find ourselves in, uh, what has he been doing and what can he tell us about what's to come this year, Tom? Well, uh, thanks, Mata. Uh, and, you know, that was a great introduction. Thanks for mentioning in capital. Uh, so if anybody here wants me to talk about corporate bonds, I can do that too. Um, so I'll just give you kind of a flyover of uh, what's happened the last few weeks at the Cubs and where we are and, and what we are uh, looking forward to this summer. You know, the, uh, obviously the virus hit the, hit the uh, country pretty quickly. Uh, on, I believe around March 12th, they decided to close down the, uh, the spring training camps where all the players were, let all the players go home and, uh, and try to pick up the pieces from that point. And, and for us, that was, that was a real gut punch. Um, you know, we had a, we have a new manager, we have a great team. We felt very confident. We were healthy. There was a lot of things going into the season that we were excited about. And, um, and obviously this is a situation that no one could foresee, but, um, it was it was tough, and as a management team, and as um, as the leaders that 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 um, you know that work with us, it was a little it was a little strange. We had a little bit of time. We had to think about what we we're going to do. And um, after a few days of kind of absorbing the information, we really came back to the fact that you know, we just really have to think about all of our constituents right now, and really take care of the people that um, that, that matter most to the organization. And uh, you know, we broke that into a couple different categories, and. And, uh, you know, the first one would be uh, community. Um, obviously, this, this virus has created a ripple effect throughout the, uh, the entire world uh, and created a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of difficult situations for, for, you know, millions if not billions of people. And uh, we started by looking at local. You know, Wrigley Field is obviously a ballpark in a neighborhood. And uh, we looked to our, uh, we looked to support our local schools as they were um, trying to get more, you know, more technology equipment for e-learning for the kids, and uh, so, and among other things, and we did grants to all the local schools or in, in the Wrigleyville area, but then we defined community much more broadly than just around the ballpark, and and really thought about what we could do for the city, and one of the first things we did is we were one of the first donors to the uh, funds that were created by by the mayor and the governor. Um, you know, in, in supporting their efforts, and hopefully, you know, at least with the mayor's effort, just support, support small businesses, because uh, we know uh, from our experience and what's happening to us, just how difficult it is 
for some small businesses, particularly in our neighborhood. So we, we donated to those funds, but, but then it was more than that. We, um, we looked at it like, well, what, what, what can we be good at helping on or what can we add value on? And we, um, we kind of came back to food insecurity, which is something that is, is just taking over. And uh, we've always been a supporter of the Lakeview Pantry, which is in our neighborhood. And the Lakeview Pantry delivers throughout the city or as people pick up packages throughout the city. And they were having trouble. They needed more space to, pre to prepare their packages that they, that they, they give to families uh, to be six feet apart. And, um, they were, and they had triple the demand of what they had just a few months ago. So we opened up the concourse at Wrigley Field, not its intended use, obviously, but uh, you know, we, we, we brought them in, now they package, and we distribute uh, food throughout the city from Wrigley Field. And on top of that, we, we partnered with local restaurants to uh, deliver meals to, uh, to people throughout the city and, um, you know, and, and try to help out that way. We've also done some other things. We've had a couple of blood drives as uh, locations for blood drives are a little bit harder to do because you need more space. We've been able to open up our office, which of course is empty. So, um, so we, uh, we've been able to do those kind of things for the community, but, but, but we also look to what can we do for, you know, what really are the heroes of the day, which are our first responders and our healthcare providers. And um, in addition to serving thousands of meals to various uh, or at various hospitals and, and precincts throughout the city, we've, um, we've opened up our hotel, uh, ably built and managed by GSB alum, Eric Nordness. Uh, we opened up our hotel to uh, allow for doctors and nurses and lab techs from local hospitals to spend the night. Should they not want it, should they feel like they've been overexposed to COVID-19 and not want to go home and expose their families, or they've just been working long hours? And would rather just go have a uh, you know go have a nice quiet place to sleep. It's it's kind of like a, a dorm for for uh, for healthcare workers, and, um, and we set them up with some coffee and food in the morning and and sandwiches when they get back, and um, do what we can to make their life incrementally easier. So, but I think I'm really proud of what we've done on the community side, and there's there's other smaller things that we do every day, but um, those are some of the big initiatives as we try to take care of our community. The next constituent base you think about, of course, is your associates, the people that, um, that work for the organization. And, and there actually are, are a fair number. We have, um, starting with the part-time, seasonal, and uh, you know, people that work in the neighborhood that depend on games, you know, there's about 2,700 people that we counted when you include people that work for the team, for, for Levy, who is our concessionaire in the ballpark, who work for our hotel work in the restaurants in our hotel. And uh, we set up an emergency assistance fund for them, funded by the, by the family and the team to, uh, to make sure that each of those individuals would get an incremental uh, check to um, help them get through the first few months of the year. Um, so we, we you know, did what we could in, in, in that department. And then of course the players, um, you know, the union and the league negotiated, uh, basically giving all the players uh, at the major league level two months of uh, major league minimum. That's not, it's not $15 an hour. It's like five grand a week, but it's still just two months and it's only minimum relative to what a lot of those guys make on a regular basis. And, you know, you think about major league baseball players as all being very wealthy. I mean, the average, the average is four and a half million dollars, but fully half of the players on the 40 man roster are a million dollars or less. A lot of them in the 600,000 range. And um, a lot of them didn't get paid. We pay them during the season and not during the off season. So many of them didn't get paid uh, from, last, from last September forward. So anyway, a little bit of uh, relief for the major league players, a few months of, uh, of a stipend for the minor league players as well um, to you know, try to help them transition into a summer where it's pretty unlikely there'll be uh, minor league baseball. So, um, so we did that for our players. And then of course, we have about 600 full-time associates. And, um, and, you know, uh, we really like our team. Uh, we, we really think that we built them the right, we, we've, we've added the right people over the years. When, um, when a lot of companies see a chance to, uh, to let people go, they think, are we going to upgrade? And, and we just don't have that opinion of our staff right now. We really believe that we have the people that we want. Um, we're working hard. We immediately cut all the costs that we could to make sure that uh, we weren't wasting money in any, any, any direction. 
and then um, you know we've you know we've kept everyone on staff for the time being, and, and will for the for the you know for a little bit longer here as we keep looking to see what's going to happen with the season. And uh, on top of that, communicating, and we can get into that more if that's of interest to the, the people on the on the call. But the um, but you know as we we've done all that you know for our constituents, and also we have reached out to our customer base, our season ticket holders. At seven o'clock, I'm doing a call for like 1,500 people who signed up for season ticket holders to talk about what's going on at the team and try to communicate, you know, and, um, and we're trying to do more stuff on our television network just to keep people engaged and connected in a time where there's no live baseball. So we took care of those things that we could, and now we're on to what's really going to happen with the rest of the season. And, um, and, you know, obviously what, what we're looking at right now is that it's very unlikely that there'll be a place where you can bring fans into a ballpark. And um, so we've, uh, we've got negotiations or discussions going with the players, you know, and how that works from here. And so there's really kind of three major concerns on that or, or, or buckets. And of course, the first one is safety. Uh, the league has worked with medical experts and infectious disease specialists um, to work out what they believe is to be the most thorough safety protocol that we can come up with, uh, with the maximum amount of medical safeguards and, um, and checkpoints and limiting access to players, testing frequently. Uh, the league has their own testing facilities we're leveraging to, uh, to do that. Um, basically doing everything we can to make it the safest possible work environment. And as everyone on this call knows, there is no, there is no 100% certainty in any of this. And uh, you can only be as far to one end of the spectrum as you can manage. And I think that the league has done everything they can to manage to be as, as, safety as, possi- as safe as possible. But that said, that's a subjective thing. And there, even at this level, there may be players for various reasons who, who may not want to play under these conditions. And, and, um, but we'll do everything we can to make it the safest work environment that, that exists. Um, what you're seeing that uh, other, other leagues are coming back this weekend. Uh, the Bundesliga in, in, in Germany is going to play. There are other, that working, other leagues working toward that. And hopefully we can follow that model and get people, get players playing again, obviously with no fans in the ballpark. Um, no fans in the ballpark is the, complica- the second complication, which is really financial. Um, you know, baseball is uniquely suited to get hit. I mean, it was uniquely, I mean, it, baseball is set up to take more damage from this pandemic than a lot of other sports. Uh, NBA and NHL were 80% way, the way through the season. So they had already collected a lot of revenue. NFL is next fall. Um, so they have time to plan. Baseball, it was right before opening day. Uh, so kind of hit us without, without an ability to prepare for any of, the, of the, uh, any of these situations. And the other thing about baseball that's different and, um, and makes this a little more painful is, you know, there's actually really two things. We get much more of our revenue from games than other sports. So at, at the Chicago Cubs, like we get about 70% of our revenue from producing the game, from having people in the ballpark. So, you know, that's tickets and, and, and concessions. And, and thank you to every business student on this call who drinks a lot of beer at Rigby Field. We appreciate your business. Like the, um, the fact is that, you know, we get most of our money from game day and about 30% from television. That includes our local television, which is our, our own channel, Marquee Sports Network, and our share of the national television contract. So we know that we've lost 70% of our revenue. And now if we can figure out a way to play in an empty ballpark, we can recoup a fraction, hopefully more than half, of 30% of our revenue. So now we're talking about 15 to 20% of our total revenue to support all the, uh, you know, all the people that I've previously discussed and pay the players. So the only way that economic model works is for the, for the league and the players to come to some understanding on a, uh, not only a proration by number of games, but a, uh, but a different amount per game. And uh, the league is, the league is working on that. And I hope that, um, I and mean, I really do hope that we can come to some understanding because the um, I think it would just mean a lot to our fans to get to get back on the field. So 
you know, we're looking at trying to get back on the field. Um, the, uh, you know, like I said, the uh, safety, number one, finances, number two. And the third one is just politics or, you know, local, sa- you know, local safety. Um, you know, for whatever we do, each and every ballpark that the league wants to play in will have to be uh, approved by local, uh, by local officials. Uh, I've, uh, I mean, I've had a few conversations with our governor and our mayor. Um, I think that with the right protocols, we'd get a, a fair hearing and a, a likely friendly hearing from our, uh, from our politicians. But um, that's, once again, it's on the spectrum. And we've seen certain, certain states and certain governors, certain mayors um, be more willing to be on the let's take a chance side of the spectrum and some more on the let's, let's shut down all spread if we can on the side of the spectrum. So anyway, uh, so right now what we're looking at is the hopes that we can, um, you know, get back on the field sometime this July and, uh, you know, and put at least a, a TV product out for all of our fans, play a season and get to the playoffs and win a, uh, win another trophy. Mm-hmm. Um, would you ever consider playing not in Chicago if it comes to that? Like I know some the NBA is thinking maybe we'll play in Orlando or things like that. Is that has that ever been something you would even consider doing? Yeah, we would consider it. Um, if that was the solution that the league um, recommended or the solution that was that was available, uh, you know, I think that everyone prefers to play in their own ballpark. But if there are, um, you know, maybe it's a, one city has a hot spot or something going on that that, that makes it even um, you know, more problematic than it typically would be, then, you know, transferring to a neutral site or, uh, or another site would be something that we'd, we'd be open-minded to, but, but, but we love Wrigley. We want to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions from the audience about baseball. So maybe I'll ask you about some, something different, which is as a leader, how, what is your style and how has that been affected by the situation? Well, it's brutal. I'm, I'm a uh, walk in your office and talk to you kind of person. Um, I'm not, I'm not a big emailer, uh, not a big conference caller. I really do like being present. Uh, what do they call it? Management, management by walking around, you know, like, and I, I just feel like my communication style is, uh, it's much, much more effective that way. And I just feel um, because in those conversations, even though you might be coming in for a specific, um, a specific reason, or to get a specific answer, or, you know, uh, to get, you know, to, to get some project move forward, you always get a chance to tell somebody, to at least tell them or imply how much you appreciate them and how hard they're working and, and um, you know, give them a compliment on something they've done, or, um, or just establish a relationship. And, um, you know, it's, it's we we got to be thankful that we have all the different technology channels that we have, you know, five or 10 years ago. This would be a lot harder. Obviously, we get Teams and Zoom and everything else, and and um, that helps. But uh, but for me, um, as someone who likes to walk into your office and just talk to you, it's it's tough. Do you view the players as a group that you would do Zoom meetings with, or do you leave that to the people who manage the players or, or the? Coach? Yeah, you know, actually, I brought that up with Theo about maybe we get a call with the players. We do calls with our associates. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, we didn't do it in, in part because, uh, you know, there's like this, this like league union dynamic. Um, you know, I, I have a pretty good relationship with uh, most, well, a lot of our players. You know, I, Chris Bryant, one of, our, one of our players had a baby. You know, I reached out to him, reached out to Anthony Rizzo for all the great charity work he's doing. And, you know, a lot of these guys have been around for a while and as well as I. So, um, so I know them and, I, and, I, and I, uh, I like the guys a lot. I think we have. You know, I don't know. I can't imagine a team with higher character players. Um, so I, I like them all as individuals. But, you know, it's, um, but I really haven't talked to them directly or had a, had a team meeting, so to speak. Uh, but across the owners, is that more of a community for you? I mean, do you feel very easy doing meetings with the other owners? You Generally, everybody's on the same page on most of these issues, you would think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there was a day that, that I hear about. It predates my involvement in baseball where – where owners built, you know, kind of fell into cliques and factions and didn't communicate well. And, and there's some classic owners meetings ended up in like giant fights and people walking out. I haven't seen any of that. Um, you know, there is, there is a distinction in the ownership group. You know, there are teams that are larger market clubs like ourselves, the Dodgers and the Red Sox and the Yankees and, and our, our revenue lines 
are um, a multiple of some of the uh, some of the smaller market clubs. But, uh, but you know, in times of like when real decisions have to be made, there's a lot of give and take. You know, I think the owners communicate very well with each other. I think the commissioner does a good job of getting a blend of owners on every decision. And um, and in this case, I haven't seen any uh, type of uh, differences amongst the owners. I think everybody just agrees that the best thing to do is find an economically feasible way to get back on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, you were mentioning about different sports and how this year some of them have sort of been more, uh, had more luck, if you will, than, than others. Um, you've also been interested in thinking about sports globally and making uh, investments in them. Where do you see this going? I mean, do you feel like, are there certain sports that you think are going to sort of take off more internationally because of this or, or in the years to come? Uh, what about something like esports? Is this the time for something like esports to take on, for example? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, for several years, I was a, uh, a substantial but not controlling owner of the Derby County Rams in, uh, in the Midlands in England. And I had a London office, so I was, going to, I was going to London every six weeks, and I would try to time it, get up and see the games, I would take customers, and I really caught the bug. I mean, the, the, the energy in the crowd there uh, is, is amazing, and, um, and I'm sure we have a lot of uh, soccer slash football fans on the call who understand um, just that that fan passion. And um, so, you know, if there was ever an opportunity in, in you know, there, somewhere back over that away, you know, we might, we might take a look, but, but, um, but, but, you know, that's a big commitment and you got to know what you're doing. And most people lose a lot of money during that. And so you have to understand what you're getting into and um, really understand the, the different dynamics between the players and the organization and the organization and the fans. And you really can't, you got to go in eyes wide open if you're going to get involved in one of those situations. So, you know, and I, I do believe, I, I do believe that, um, that global football has, has more room to grow. I think that um, in the U.S. it continues to grow. Uh, China, India, you know, half the world's population, half the world's GDP is now just starting to watch. And it is the global sport. So I do think that, you know, once all this, um, all this COVID stuff is behind us, I think, there's more growth there as the international sport, but there will be, there'll be winners and losers for sure. Mm. Like the big brands will continue to grow. Small brands won't have an opportunity to grow much beyond what they have right now. So you have to be careful where you're, um, where you're at. With regard to esports, we've looked at a lot of esports. We have a small investment in a, uh, in a game manufacturer. Um, we looked at doing different types of uh, uh, teams. You know, they've, one of the things that they've done with some of the, some of the big games is create, local franchises like teams to uh, you know play against each other and none of those opportunities really worked for us the um, it, it works really really well for the game publisher uh, it works less well for the for the team owner and um, so it never really was something that was attractive enough for us to get really excited about but I, I do think that's going to continue to grow and I think quarantine doesn't hurt I mean it's I think I think a lot of people are you know picking up you know, picking up the uh, Call of Duty again just because they're bored, you know, because they haven't played, you know, they haven't played in a while or they're coming back to play a game they like. And I also am, uh, I'm, I'm continually impressed with the game publishers for how they keep their content fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, these, some of these games, these League of Legends, Call of Duty, these games, they've been around for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once in a while, a Fortnite literally and figuratively parachutes in and it has a new, uh, has a, creates a huge market space for itself. But, but typically, you know, it's a lot of the same games people are playing and they have some staying power, which I don't think a lot of people would have predicted 10 years ago. Right. So um, I think it's a great, it's a great business uh, for people that create games. Um, not certain it's a great business for people to buy franchises to play the games that are created by those publishers. Going back to your purchase, uh, I had mentioned you had these three things that you had wanted to, to achieve uh, when you bought the, the Cubs and in many ways, you, you sort of have a, the, the dream job, right? You, you know, the owner of the Chicago Cubs. I mean, has it been everything you thought it would be? What is sort of the pressure of having a job like that? Well, I mean, it's more dreamy other years, and this is not a, <laughs> not a, not a great one. But the, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I've been a Cub fan for a long time. Uh, met my wife in the bleachers, been to a lot of games, kind of lived across the street from Wrigley Field as a young guy. Kind of knew what we were getting into. I think um, owners have to know 
what they're really getting into. I think a lot of people buy it, uh, buy their teams, and and don't don't think that hard about why they bought their teams. For us, it was just it was a passion, it was a love. Um, I think we did see an opportunity to uh, grow, you know, you know, grow the business of the Cubs and an opportunity to make the team on the field better. But uh, but you really have to have that love for the game because there are, are um, I mean. Jerry Reinsdorf always says there's good days and bad days. There's just so many more bad days because like your team's losing or, or you know, and, and there's, you know, like, yeah, you, you've always got the media, like, you know, to deal with and then you have a high profile life and, and um, you know, owners aren't typically sympathetic figures to the, uh, you know, to the, to the print media and, or the talk radio people. So you have to be able to have a, a relatively thick skin, but um but, you know, I, I, I think I, you know, I mean, I, not only do we get in for the right reason, I think one of the things that really keeps me going, another reason this year is so bad for me is at a ball game, I walk around every game and I talk to, you know, 15, 20, 25 people. And, 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 that, and that's my favorite part, like just being part of that community, being part of that, uh, that setting. And, um, you know, and we won't be able to do that this year, even if we play games. And, um, but, you know, I, I'm all in for the social side of it. So I think that helps. And, um, and, you know, the other stuff is kind of noise. So if you think back to your time at Booth, uh, how has that, how, how was the experience for you and how has that sort of helped you in the way you think about what you do today? Well, I think that the thing that I took away from Booth, the class that mattered the most to me was a class on entrepreneurship. And the, um, you know, working on an outline of how to start a business. And, you know, I didn't take it with any intent. I wasn't like a lot of the really smart young people that are in the school now who know they're going to be entrepreneurs or, or you know, intend to start a company or already have an idea or they're in the new venture challenge. And that wasn't me at all. I was, um, I was just someone who was in the trading world knowing that I wanted to get into a different part of the financial markets. And, um, you know, but a few years later, in the, working in the corporate bond space, saw an opportunity to do something that other companies weren't doing and the big firms didn't want to do. So I uh, started in capital and literally the first thing I did to write that business plan was to pull out the old file. The, the file your wife says, just throw that crap away. I pulled out the old file, got out the old outline and literally wrote my business plan off that outline. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that was probably the way it helped me the most. I also stayed in touch with, um, with professors. I still talk to Steve Kaplan. He was a professor of mine. Other professors who have moved on to other schools, I stay in touch with. So um, I made some relationships that lasted a lifetime as well. And um, so I think that's probably the way it helped me the most. So we have, we have lots of questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to maybe start the audience questions now. Jessica? Okay. Sure. Um, several questions here for you. So I'll just start at the top. Um, what do you love most about the city of Chicago? Wow. Uh, that's a hard question. There's so many ways to answer that. You know, uh, I, I mean, it's tough because there, you can't do it now. But my favorite part about Chicago is like June. Like when, when, when it finally is warm, every restaurant, every bar puts out tables on the sidewalks. Everybody, it's like, the, it, just, it just blooms. And suddenly people are all in great moods. Everyone looks great. Everyone feels great. And, um, and you just get out and it's, you know, it's obviously a very relatively clean, accessible, uh, fun, friendly, uh, you know, uh, just, a, you know, like warm people, um, you know, Midwest vibe, Midwest values. But I just think like, a su you know, a summer day in Chicago, you can't beat it. Um, a question on leadership style. Why do you think Joe Madden couldn't pivot and change his leadership style to match that, um, the, that of which the team needed to continue success in the years four and five of his contract? Well, I, I don't know that uh, Joe couldn't pivot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about it that way at all. Um, I think that uh, there were a lot of factors that went into the disappointing finishes we had the last couple of years. And, um, you know, and I, I wouldn't say that any type of pivot or anything Joe could have done differently or would have done differently would have made any difference. You really can't say that. That's not, that's not fair to him. It's not fair to the players. And it's not something that I would um, – that uh, I just wouldn't accept the, the premise of the question. Um, that said, you know, every, every manager has a style. Sometimes those styles work better in certain circumstances, but, um, but like, I, I don't, I don't 
I don't pin this on Joe or his management style or lack of pivot or anything like that. I think that he did, did the best he could. Players love him. I love him as a person. He won us a World Series, and I just wish him all the luck in, uh, in California. What were you most surprised by um, about the Cubs on the first day that you took ownership? Um, I think there were a couple of early surprises. Um, it, it was really a dump. Like the, uh, not just Wrigley Field had not, you know, received any love or any type of a meaningful investment for over 50 years. The offices were terrible. I mean, it really was an afterthought. The Tribune Corp owned the team and the team was very much a, uh, um, it was like a, it was like a, it was like a, a, a TV asset and it, it was something they would produce for, they had for WGN and WGN radio and the facilities were just really bad. Uh, you know, they were, fax machines and all the servers were in a closet and there was like, they had like, like a, like a little rain hat over the servers. So cause the closet leaked from time to time. Um, it just was really, really bad facilities. And then the other thing that, um, you know, it was just the, 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 the um, like the, the, the culture was okay, but like the, the morale was very low and in part because, and, and mostly because the Tribune was slowly going bankrupt at this time. And when you have an organization where every morning your associates come in and they're told that, you know, they're, they're getting their 401k match taken away or they're, you know, they're not going to, you know, they're, or they're, or they're, this is shrinking or they're losing that part of the budget or we can't, we can't hire anyone else to help you regardless of your workload. Like that, that's a pretty tough place to be. And um, so you think when you buy a baseball team, you're walking into the happiest place on earth when, when in reality it was, um, you know, kind of a place that the, that the parent company had underinvested in. And um, I think it, it showed in the morale of the, uh, of the associates. Can you tell us how a pro sports team um, balance sheet differs from a conventional business or are there more similarities than differences? Well, one way it differs and a meaningful way it differs is effectively all of your costs are fixed and your revenues are variable. So the way a baseball team looks at the, you know, doing its budget is you project how much you're going to make in tickets, how much you're going to make on television, how much you're going to make in sponsorships, and you come up with a number. Then you project, you go back, then you go look at your costs, like I said, which are almost 100% fixed. And then you, you, you take out your fixed costs, and then you turn it over, you turn whatever's left over to your baseball organization to put to work in the way that they think is most likely to win you a championship. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, there's, uh, there's no dividends. You don't, you don't, you're not shooting for, for some kind of uh, profit margin. Uh, you know, you, you don't have institutional investors looking at your ROI. You don't have, you know, people talking about what kind of multiple are we going to get for this? Any of that, any of that, you kind of zero out your P&L. But, um, but, it, but that's a highly risky model, obviously, because if you spend on your players and they get hurt or they um, just don't perform and you're not selling tickets at, what, at the rate you projected, you suddenly have losses. And a lot of teams have losses. And, and almost every team in, in Major League Baseball runs pretty much like I just described. And um, there's very little room for error in the model. Uh, much less room for pandemics, which take about 90% of your revenue. But like, um, but the fact is that um, it's just different. You have to be really careful how you manage. You have to budget very carefully. And, um, and you, just, uh, I mean, you just really have to understand that every season you go into it, you're taking the risk that you underperform, and that will lead to uh, losses for the club. Jason writes, thank you, Tom, for your time today. How do you see game theory at play in Marquee Sports Network's negotiations with Comcast? Who needs the other more, in quotes? Thanks, and go Cubs. Well, I'm way too far away from business school to talk game theory. But, uh, but in terms of the negotiation, I, I think it's about even. I mean, the fact is that um, uh, Comcast does represent uh, the largest number of homes in our market. Uh, we are the largest sports draw in our market. Not only do we have um, the, the large fan base, but just the number of games. So um, I think everyone has an incentive to get, get this one done. And I honestly believe like 
once we get games back online, there'll be a lot of incentive to, to, to finish this up. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, there'll, there'll be a future where uh, everyone in Chicago can watch the Cubs. You mentioned preparing for as far um, to the end of the spectrum as possible. How many contingencies do you have prepared for the remainder of this season and the next? Yeah, that's a great question because of that last word, the next. Um, everything that we do as we plot how to go through this season, um, we have to keep in context what happens in 2021. So for this year, I mean, it's really about cutting everything that isn't necessary so that we can maintain uh, our, our associate base and keeping as much optionality on that as we can. And that's, that's our focus for 2020. And um, as, as we've all seen, as everyone on this call has seen, what the, uh, what the virus has, um, the virus has literally mutated probably, but, but like the, the, the conversation has mutated from time to time as well. And so something's gonna change. We don't know in a month, there'll be a, uh, there'll be a different set of facts around the virus. We wanna be as flexible and, and have as much optionality as possible. And for, for students who are going into management jobs, I mean, never underestimate the value of having incremental optionality. And, you know, and if you, even if you have to pay for it a little bit, it's, it's going to be worth it in many situations. Now, the other thing that we have to think about is this is not necessarily over with the 2020 season. We have a lot of, a lot of um, and there's, there's been a lot of uh, politicians who have come out and said, without a vaccine, then I don't think I can see large gatherings happening again, uh, which everyone who reads the paper and everyone on this call knows is unlikely to be soon or guaranteed. Like there's no guarantee that we'll ever have a vaccine that's effective. And there's no guarantee that it'll happen in a time frame before April 1st next year when we start playing baseball. So um, we have to be thoughtful about when we look at uh, how we plan for next year, to make sure that uh, once again retaining our optionality, but but making sure that we don't uh, we don't uh, do something this season that we have trouble unwinding next season, and so um, I mean it's a real it's a real concern and a real challenge, and you know and then on top of all that, forgetting vaccines and you know uh, whether or not people can get whether there's proper treatments and therapies or whatever else, but um, I mean, there's also just the fact that there's a lot of people that might not feel comfortable coming into groups next year. I mean, so we have to be careful to not assume that just because the, uh, this year is over that 2021 is going to be the same as 2019. And so we have to be very careful about that as well. Um, fortunately, uh, the Cubs have, we have a great, a great team of uh, managers and uh, very quantitative, very analytical guys that have modeled up, you know, dozens of scenarios for next year. And so as we, as more information comes in throughout the course of this year, I think we'll be as prepared as any team for what happens next year. But once again, things are always changing, but uh, you definitely have to worry about next year as you make this year's decisions. How have you handled your e-commerce exposure? Have you seen an increase in transactions via online shopping? Well, in baseball, as well as the other major U.S. sports, you don't control your e-commerce experience. It's controlled by the league itself. Um, we, we have the ability to, to do some marketing, social media. We have a YouTube channel. We, have, we do all the Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. But, um, but we don't have a lot of flexibility to uh, control e-commerce. Um, you know, that said, I haven't looked at the numbers in a while, but I'm sure the number of, the number of Cubs jerseys that are sold online goes up every single year. Although um, we do... Uh, we do have our own bricks and mortar uh, group that has done a really nice job at Wrigley at providing more more access to merchandise. But but you know, um, frustratingly for us, that's really out of our control. That's uh, managed by the league. Um, more of a lighthearted question: If you could play professional baseball, what position would you play? Oh yeah, good question. Yeah, maybe like a, maybe like a center fielder. I don't know, just kind of like. You get your own space. You get to play every day. Um, I think you know if you're good. It's just kind of a it's a it's a key position. I like starting pitcher would be good if if you just want to work once a week. Yeah, catcher is too tough. You break your fingers too often. Like I think I think center field. Like that's what I would pick. Just you know, um, just be be, be a, a good a good center fielder. 
Given the cash flow hole because of COVID this year, are you considering using Wrigley Field for other activities like concerts, et cetera, this year? Uh, this person is clearly a cricket fan because they ask if you could potentially host cricket games there one day. I would love to have a cricket game. You know, what they've done with cricket internationally, uh, obviously by switching the format, it's become a much more accessible sport. And obviously it's, uh, you know, huge in certain parts of the world. We were supposed to play in London this year, uh, play the Cardinals in London. And part of that was going to be go to Lords, the cricket ground, and try to get our players to hit bowlers, the cricket bowlers, and try to get, you know, cricket batters to hit our pitchers and stuff. It would have been really fun. Um, well, so we'd love to have cricket. I think that'd be a great thing for the city, and I think it'd be a great way to use Wrigley Field. Um, the problem, of course, is just gatherings in general. Um, we did have, uh, we do have, uh, I believe about 12 concerts that were scheduled for this summer, but you know, those are all subject to the uh, you know, what happens with local local regulations and the ability to gather it all. So um, you know, we, we'd love to have more things at Wrigley, but it's not really a, a baseball only kind of problem. It's just, you can't have gatherings. And so until we can have gatherings, we, we don't have a lot of flexibility. So when we have, when we have, when we can fill the seats, we'll find ways to do it, but cricket would be awesome. What's the mindset of the ball players now? Do you have any predictions for any records to be broken this season? I don't know about records. I mean, it's going to be uh, everything that happens this year, if we can get back on the field, we'll have a little bit of an asterisk with it. Um, you know, it's only going to be 82 games if, at, at the most if, uh, if, we, if we do get back. So, um, you know, maybe you could break a record for batting average because you only have to play half a year. But, um, but I don't think anyone's thinking about records this year. I think everyone really is just focused on, you know, can we get the national pastime uh, back on the field, uh, back on, uh, you know, back on television anyway, and, and in front of, in front of fans everywhere and, um, and get to a really exciting playoff, playoff season. With so many competing financial and political pressures, how have you been managing disagreements with other league owners, employees, et cetera? Um, well, with league owners, like I talked about earlier, I think, uh, one of the things Commissioner Manfred does really well is keeps owners uh, to working together. You know, one of the things he instituted a few years ago when he took over as commissioner was a lot of different committees where guys rotate in and out. You get to know a lot of the other owners. And there are substantially different business models between the Yankees and the Tampa Rays or between, you know, us and the Marlins. Like, they're, they're, they're just different size businesses. But, uh, but everyone – Everyone on the ownership groups really kind of, they, they understand that what's best for the game, I think is, is important. And we communicate pretty well and everyone kind of, you know, understands each other. There's no real drama. Like I said, there used to be a lot of factionalism or clicks. I don't, I don't really see that now at Major League Baseball. And with respect to the second part of the question, um, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about our team president, Crane Kenny, and our team baseball president, Theo Epstein. They're both, not only are they, really good, to, you know, they're, they're, they're great at their jobs. They're just, they're great managers. Um, I trust them both. And uh, I talk to them every day and, you know, we just kind of write it, write it out and just kind of adjust the circumstances. And there really hasn't been anything that I would call a team conflict out of that. Another baseball question. What is your view of using the designated hitter in the national league? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that, um, um, I'm, you know, I, I go back and forth, to be honest. I have a lot of old school in me that kind of likes it when the pitcher gets up and executes a good bunch or gets lucky on a hit or um, something like that. But, um, but I, I do understand that a lot of times that's a pretty uh, uneventful at bat and we could, you know, we could jazz it up with a player that has a better chance of getting on base. Um, there has been um, in the conversation for this year, uh, and this is, this is, I believe it's out in the public that the, um, we may play a little more interleague play because of the, the compressed season. You might spend more time playing against other local clubs and, uh, and then there might be more DH opportunities. Um, I'm open-minded to that, but over the long run, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I, I, I really go back and forth on it. How, um, has COVID challenged or changed the way that, um, you are, sorry, 
trying to reread this here. How has COVID um, created any challenges as you are working with players on contract negotiations? Well, the, um, the players, uh, once we suspended the season, you know, it suspended all player movement and the players contract negotiation, uh, like the, 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 the time you do that is really, you know, after the season last year. And so by the time they get to spring training, they all pretty much understand their contract situation. So all the contracts were negotiated well before uh, COVID was a, was a thing here anyway. Um, so it hasn't really impacted it yet. I think it'll be interesting at the end of the season, um, depending on what happens. And, and once again, with our lack of clarity into what the future economics of baseball look like, different owners are probably going to have to look at different estimates on how much revenue they're going to have which will drive, and you know, going back to how I explained how the model works, will drive how much, how many dollars they have to give to players. And I think that'll be very interesting because there may be owners who are very optimistic about how, back, how fast baseball will bounce back. And there may be owners who are going to be more conservative. Certainly every owner in baseball has taken a massive financial loss this year. And that may impact how much uh, money that they have to uh, pay players in the future or may impact, um, you know, how confident they are about revenues bouncing back. So um, right now it doesn't mean anything because they're already signed, but end of the season, it'll be very interesting. What have you found interesting about the Korean Baseball League's restart? And are there any specific learnings for the Cubs or Major League Baseball? Um, you know, I, I haven't studied their, I haven't really looked at their safety protocols although I'm sure that they're pretty good. I'm sure that the, the Major League Baseball has looked at that. I love the, uh, the pictures of the fans in the crowd. I think that's pretty funny. At first, I thought it was kind of corny. You guys have all seen the photo probably, but basically they put cardboard cutouts of people in the crowd. And um, I thought it was kind of corny until then I read that um, a German soccer team had uh, sold to, to, to raise money for their charity for like $200 or euros or whatever. They... Um, they sold the right to put your picture on a seat in the, uh, in the stadium. So I thought, well, that actually is pretty cool. That's kind of a funny thing. If we ever get balls, uh, you know, get, get, the, uh, get baseball back in Wrigley, maybe we'll do something similar. Um, but away from that, I haven't really studied Korean baseball too much. Um, I just uh, I give them credit for coming up with a solution and getting back on the field. What's your relationship with White Sox, with the White Sox and Jerry Reinsdorf? And do you have much interaction with them? And sorry, somebody says, go Sox. <laughs> That's okay. I know there's some Sox fans out there. Um, you know, uh, lately, yes. Uh, you know, typically in a regular season, um, you know, in a, uh, in a normal season, uh, I'll see Jerry at the, uh, the owners' meetings. And we don't have that much more to really, you know, go over. We have worked on some charitable efforts together. We, um, we every year put in money for anti-violence initiatives uh, for the city of Chicago. So we have a few places where we, we uh, work together on, on the charitable side and uh, we do run into each other at the, at the games. Um, this season, I've talked to a lot more owners than I normally would just because we're all trying to get more information and kind of get more perspective. So I've talked to Jerry a little bit more this time around, but we have a good relationship. And um, when I was looking you know, 10 years ago now, 10, 11 years ago, looking at buying the club, the, uh, the first thing that I did was go spend a few innings with Jerry at the White Sox Park and, and kind of like talk to him about things I should think about. And uh, he gave me really great advice. So um, I think Jerry is one of the best owners in sports. And um, aside from the day they play at Wrigley or when we're at the cell, that I got nothing but best wishes for the White Sox. What measures do you take to balance the discipline required to run and grow the business of the Cubs with the desire to win and upgrade um, the on-field product? Well, you know, kind of like what we talked about a while ago, the, um, you, you end up pretty much putting all your financial resources into your ball club. Now, that said, we have been able to do some work outside the park, and we, we've, um, in order to keep the business vibrant and growing, looking for opportunities, and, you know, what, what, what I think the more progressive or more, uh, yeah, I don't know about sophisticated, but the more active baseball teams have done is realize that you're going to bring 3 million people to a street corner. Why don't you try to uh, serve them in other ways? And so we've developed our hotel, Gallagher Way, which is our, um, our plaza that we program for games and for non-game days. 
Uh, we have restaurants. You know, it's, that's a really nice business. Um, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice business. It, it isn't part of the Cubs. And in fact, the amount of money you make on those businesses doesn't really, um, it doesn't add up to a major league baseball player. But it, it's, it's good. It's fun. It's great for the fans. It, it makes it a better game to experience. So we've looked at growing the business through ways that not only are um, thoughtful and profitable for the organization, but ways that uh, really improve the fan experience uh, every game. So, and, and the neighborhood experience as well. So, um, so, you know, that's the way we've kind of taken it. But you see most, most teams are doing more stuff outside the park and trying to be more creative in what they do for fans on a game day. Can you talk a bit about in capital and how this crisis has impacted the corporate bond la landscape, particularly from investors' perspectives? Yeah, thanks for the corporate bond question. I was kind of kidding, but I appreciate it. Uh, the um, yeah, well, in capital it underwrites corporate bonds and a lot of other financial products, and um, the dislocation in the corporate bond market in March was was astounding. Um, I, I guess it's unprecedented. I don't, you know, I was there. I lived through the financial crisis. But I've never seen anything where you know bonds of certain companies like Ford or whoever go from you know trading at you know two, three, four percent yields to fourteen in, in just a couple of days. And in fact, if you were long corporate bond inventory in those days of pretty much any any corporate bond, you um, you really had a you you had a tough week. So um, anyway, um, as it affects investors, you know I think you just have to watch and be careful. I um. I do think there's good opportunities and I do believe in corporate bonds. I think people for their taxable portfolios should have a nice ladder of, of good corporate bonds, maybe investment grade, maybe a little bit below investment grade to get some yield. That's okay. As long as it's blended in the right way. Um, I think people should have that. Um, what I don't know the impact and I don't know the scale. I don't think anyone does. When you see that the, the fed is going to be purchasing different types of risk assets, you know, buying, buying, uh, and they talk about buying corporate bonds. They talk about buying, you know, different ETFs. I don't know how to play that. I don't know how. I don't know how you think of that, um, because ultimately, that's a, that's a that's a diseconomy. That's that's something that takes the value of the of the natural value of the security away from where it should be. And um, I don't know what the long term implications of that is. Short term implications are good. I'm not sure what the long term is, but um, but uh, but. Uh, for investors, you know, it's okay to have some, buy some, they're good, good for you. Do you view sports as a product for fans or an advertising platform? Well, obviously a product for fans. You know, if, if you don't have fans, you don't have anything. Um, the, uh, and to the extent that you can, you, know, you can find corporate partners that want to associate their brand with your team, and you can monetize that, that helps you create more, uh, more dollars to put back onto the field. So it's kind of this virtuous cycle. Like you can create, you can create, uh, if you can create a strong fan base and a strong relationship with your fans, and then you have a, a great partner that comes in and wants to be part of that, that's terrific. And you can get those dollars and put them back into a better, a better performance and hopefully more wins and maybe a championship on the field. So, um, you know, without the fans, you're nothing. Um, in fact, every first day of spring training, I, I talk to the players and I always say a couple things every year the same way. But one of the things I always say is, um, you know, just always be great to the fans, treat our fans like gold, because without them, we'd all be doing something else. And that's, that really drives away, make our decisions at the Cubs. A few questions about uh, winning the World Series. How do you think about monetary value, the monetary value of winning the World Series, and how does that affect your team's valuation? A lot less than people would think, honestly. Um, the uh, the way the, the the dollars you get from winning from going to the playoffs is largely a function of uh, who you play in the playoffs and how far the playoffs go, how many games they last. The way the model works is that for the games that are the mandatory games, like three out of five or four out of seven, those first four games, the vast majority, like I forget, like 90% of the revenue from those tickets goes to the players association to pay the players in the playoffs. If you go to games five, six, seven, like we did in 2016, then that flips and the majority of those dollars go back to the teams. So our playoff run was, was valuable to us. Um, because we went deep in the playoffs. 
And it also helps you to play larger market teams because you split the gate. So if you're playing a small market club, there's just not, that, not as many dollars in the pool to split. But, but ultimately, like, um, you get a little bit of extra revenue for winning. Um, what we do with that is we, um, we, we pay bonuses to all of our associates for we play, pay playoff bonuses. You spend a lot on you know, bringing the play, uh, you know, taking your, uh, taking your associates to the, the away games like we did. If you win everything, you spend millions and millions on rings, which is a good thing, but, uh, but expensive. So, um, so, you know, it doesn't really net you that much where a lot of teams can make money on winning the world series is they have some flexibility to raise their ticket prices for the following year. And, um, you know, and they probably, you know, we're typically, typically, you know, we have a long waiting list for season tickets. We're, we're typically pretty good in that department, but if you're a team that, um, is always looking for more season ticket holders or more ticket buyers. Um, you know, winning, winning the World Series gives you a big tailwind. So you can typically monetize it more effectively the following season, but, but you can make the playoffs in baseball and it's almost worth nothing to you. I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it over to Dean Rajan. What's the greatest lesson you've learned in business thus far? Oh my God. Did someone send that in or did you, anyway. I did not plant that one. Someone sent that in. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's the way you treat people. You know, when I, when I talk to, um, when I talk to students, uh, you know, graduates or even young people in the business world, and I, I, a lot of them come to my office, I always say like, like the first half of your career is about your accomplishments. Like, did you show up at work on time? Can you do the work? Did, did, I mean, did, did, were you effective? Could you handle it? But the second half of your career is going to be about your relationships. During that time, did you, did, you, did, you, did you learn to work well with people? Did you treat people well? Because the opportunities for, that you're going to get in business are going to be so much more driven by the people that, um, you know, much more driven than you imagine by the people you've developed relationships with. So um, I think the way you treat people is critical. Um, everyone judges you by the way you treat people. Um, you know, and, and if you don't treat people well, if you can't work with others, you are limiting your own career. So I think it's going to be hard for me to top that with another question. So I think we'll, we'll stop there. I wanted to thank you, Tom, for coming here, for your uh, incredible candor and your openness in discussing a wide variety of issues. Uh, it was fascinating for me, and I'm sure our students and, and the alumni, everyone found it fascinating as well. So thank you. And I think uh, I speak for everyone when I say I hope that there is a season and I hope that you will emerge as the winner at the, at the end of that. Thanks again, Tom. All right. Thank you.